these are the four traits that we uh, ended up selecting for. Growth rate, mothering ability, carcass quality, and feed efficiency. And David set up all the parameters and set everything on the computer, you know, how to do this. And, and the thing about this, you see, low swine, uh, decalp swine breeders was the key for us to being more successful. If we'd have stayed at Lubbock, we could have never done all this. We wouldn't have had the money to do this. They had, they, they, they in a, well, one, two things that happened. One thing is that when we started talking to them and we saw what they had, we said, what you have is not gonna work. You're gonna have to get rid of that. And if you don't wanna do it our way, don't want it, we don't wanna do it. And when we do this merger, we want it written in the contract, you're gonna do it our way or, we, or we're gonna stay like we are. And they wrote it in the contract that they do it our way. And of course, the two people there, they left. And uh, so they had the money to do this and we, sp we spent $50 million in about the next five or six years building facilities and putting in programs to get this thing going. So after we got it going, they said, uh, they're, they're originally we're gonna build all these production farms in Illinois. You couldn't, even, you couldn't even put, in the county in Illinois, you couldn't even put, in DeKalb County, you couldn't even put a commode in without a permit. You couldn't put a commode in a pig barn without a permit. And uh, I said, when I was 14 years old, I went on the wheat harvest all the way from Texas to South Dakota, and I remembered in, Can in Southwest Kansas, there was a lot of wheat, there weren't many people, a lot of grain sorghum, and I said, we need to go to Southwest Kansas. So we went, at that time, there weren't any pigs there. This was in 1974. We went to Southwest Kansas. And you know, being a pig operation, when you say that, everybody said, oh, we don't want a pig operation. Well, instead of just going down and buying land and start building pig operations, we went down and found places we wanted and we talked to the landowner. <coughs> and said, so we want to buy, we're gonna buy this land and we're gonna put in a big pig operation, like 1,200 sows this, on this one piece of land. If you don't want us here, you tell us and we'll go someplace else. They said, no, we want you here because you're gonna buy grain. We don't have a place to sell our grain. <clears throat> so we started buying uh, land and we built, uh, we built eight, eight farms right here in Southwest Kansas, close to Liberal, Plains, Kansas. We had 250 employees. We, we moved to Plains, Kansas, they had 1,200 people. We had 250 employees. They didn't have a doctor. Within three years, they had a doctor. They put in uh, welding shops. They put in trucking shops. They built apartments. And the bank, <coughs> bank there, their, their deposits increased every year. It, it was a, a plus for that area. Well, Farmers Union was big in Kansas. So we, just, we were gonna expand again. <coughs> And they decided they didn't, Farmers Union didn't want us to expand, so they went to the state legislature and proceeded to get a law passed that corporations could not build hog farms in Kansas. And they got it passed. After always oh, a lot of fighting, it's on the front page of the Wichita News uh, every week. So we said, we're gonna expand someplace. And I said, well, we'll just go back to Texas because we were, we were uh, right here. We're only 50 miles across here to Texas. And I said, you know, we had a corporation in Texas big, uh, raising hogs. Nobody said a word. We just go back to Texas. Well, we got a call from uh, the uh, Beaver County, which is in uh, right here in the Panhandle, Oklahoma. And we got a call one day from this guy who was president of the Chamber of Commerce. He'd been up to see what we were doing. He said, they might want you in Kansas, but we want you in Oklahoma. And I said, well, do you have a corporate farming law? And he said, I don't know. And he contacted his senator and said, yeah, we do. I said, well, send me a copy of it, and he did, and I had our lawyers look at it, and they said, you can't go to, you can't go to Oklahoma. So I called him, and I said, We're, we can't go to Oklahoma, we're going to Texas. So this Senator Leonard was their senator, he called, and he said, uh, we want you in Oklahoma. I'm gonna get the law changed for you. You have your lawyers write the way you want it, send it to me, and I'll get it changed. And I thought, yeah, right. The governor of Kansas said he wasn't gonna let that leather law pass, and he did. But anyway, he sent the law, I had the lawyers write it, sent it to him, he called one day and he said, I can get this thing passed, but don't want you to say anything, don't you give any, don't say anything to the newspaper, don't give any interviews, don't even mention Oklahoma. And so I thought, well, he's not gonna get that passed, there's no way he can get it passed. 
in two months, one day I got a telephone call and it said, this is Senator Leonard, Leonard's secretary. Senator Leonard told me to call you and tell you that that bill has passed the House and the Senate and the governor's going to sign it tomorrow and you can start bearing land in Oklahoma. And the other thing he said when he called me, he said, I want one thing. I don't want anything in writing. I want you to promise me if I get this bill passed that you'll build those farms in Oklahoma. And I said, where in Oklahoma? And he said, in the three counties in the Panhandle. And I said, exactly where we'll build them because that's where we wanted to go. He got that passed and we built five farms there. So we ended up with 13 farms in that area, and then we had farms in Texas, and in those farms in Illinois, and then we had operations in 11 other states. <clears throat> this is a farm, one of the first farms we built in Kansas. See, but then we kind of had it worked out. This is a breeding gestation. We had a fence around the whole thing, keep out animals. This is farrowing, nursery, and finishing. We had a showering building, an office building. And this was 1,200 South unit. And we had eight of those in, in Kansas. It takes people to run them. These are the farm managers, employees. This is, this is not all of them, but it's all, all of them we could get together that day that took the picture. I asked David if he and Gretchen were in it, and he said he didn't, he didn't, he didn't remember. And Gretchen said she remembered, but, she, <laughs> but anyway, we had great people. Our, our policy was to hire college graduates, and we didn't care what kind of degree they had. We had one guy that had an English degree. One had biology. You know, they had, they, we didn't care what, as long as they had a college degree, we hired them. And we hired a lot of people from Texas A&M. We had, that was our number one school because the people of A&M, they worked hard, they were dependable, and they were honest. And of course, they were from Texas too, so that, that helped out. But we really did. In fact, I was telling David, there's, there's two guys I know that one of them from A&M that worked for us, one of them, he has a bit, his own business now in Iowa. Another one owns 3,000 sows in Georgia. And so they've done quite well. <clears throat> we hired a football coach, uh, <laughs> high school football coach, heard about it. He said, I always want to raise pigs. and said, I'd like to come to work for y'all. Add eco, add ed, animal science. It didn't make any difference because we had a training program. Everybody had to go through the training program. <clears throat> we had manuals. We started this in Lubbock. That was another thing, advantage of going to DeKalb. When I went to DeKalb, we could, I had secretaries that could do all these manuals. And uh, this, is a, this is a manager's manual. That's a farrowing nursery, uh, a, a breeding gestation, farrowing, nursery, finishing. And so we had classes. We gave tests. They had to learn how to raise pigs in confinement. Then there was, there was a deal where you, you could send off and enter this uh, program where you were evaluated on what kind of uh, employee training program you had. And one year, uh, I forgot what it was, 19, 1995, we won the National Business Education Partnership uh, Award, and we were selected over IBM, Caterpillar, and Lockheed. All three of the, all of those were in it, and you know when we said they were in it, I said, no way we're gonna win this thing, we did. And that, well, that's before they passed the law. At that time, the Kansas State Legislature passed a unanimous resolution recognizing the cab swine breeders for that award. He sent us this big certificate. Three years later, they passed the law. We said we couldn't raise hogs in Kansas anymore. <laughs> <laughs> and we had our own trucks and uh, they shipped pigs, uh, you know, all over the country. Then we... Uh, in 19, pretty soon after we started, I went to Japan, and we had a company that was doing, and we were working with in poultry. And so they wanted to get in the pig business, and so we laid out the operation for them, sold them breeding stock, and uh, this is on, on the top of a mountain in, on Kishu, where that's where Nagasaki was, where the atomic bomb was dropped. It's not too far from where this farm was. And then they had another one up at, at Fukuoka, which was north of uh, Japan, where they had the earthquake. And, and uh, the Jap they're still operating that farm. In fact, I sent them an email after that earthquake and asked them if they were, any of them were hurt, and they weren't hurt, and it tore up some of their equipment, but uh, they got some radiation. 
and I don't know what's happened since about the pigs. But uh, I went, I made uh, 20 trips to Japan, and, and tw I went over there every year to work with their producers and to work with this company. Great people to work with. You know, I mean, you know, I grew up, I was 15 years old when the Second World War ended, and we all hated Japanese. And I was skeptical when I went over there, but I'll tell you what, I'd rather work with the Japanese than anybody, a lot better than the Chinese. When they told you something and shook your hand, that was it. You didn't have to have a contract. Those people were, they were great to work with and, and uh, we enjoyed it. This was a, a restaurant. They believed in integration. So they had, this guy got connected up with a Japanese hog producer and he put, his, put this sign up and he, he advertised it as DeKalb pork. And he had one of the best cutlets you ever, ever eat. And he and his wife owned this little restaurant. <clears throat> then we, uh, in the 1990s, we started uh, uh, talking to, I went to China, and at that time is when they first opened the door, and people were still in their mouth suits. And uh, we started talking to them about putting in hog farms. They wanted, they wanted, they were starting to, you know, to start to look to see how they could feed their people. I mean, it was pathetic. I mean, you see people that you could tell they didn't have enough to eat. They weren't starved, but they didn't have enough to eat. And uh, so they said they wanted to build a farm, some farms near Beijing to produce a million hogs a year. It took two years to get that contract worked. This is the guy, he's in charge, he's in charge of all livestock in China, everything. And uh, we signed that contract. I'll tell you how hard they are to deal. We signed the contract. I get home, two weeks later, they called or emailed, or it's fax. We didn't have email, they had fax. Fax wanting to change the contract. <laughs> and our lawyer said, you know, you're never gonna get this deal done. So I talked to our treasurer and we had a, in the contract it said that when the hogs were delivered, we got paid. And so I said, how do we make sure that we get paid? He said, you gotta have a confirmed, irrevocable letter of credit. If you have that, when you deliver those pigs and you produce those shipping documents, they give you the money. And we're gonna ship a 747 loaded with pigs to, to Beijing. So I, I called the Chase, Chase had a, a branch in Beijing. I called Chase in New York and, and, got, it, and got the letter of credit confirmed. And so we just, we just kept dickering on the contract. We never did change it. But I said, they gotta take them now because we got an ironclad contract and we deliver the pigs and we took the documents down to the bank and got our money. And uh, as far as I, and, well, we had to train their people. They sent six people over here for six months for us to train and we had to send a person over there for six months. Interesting thing about the six people they sent, they'd never been out of the county. So we rented them a house in, in Kansas. We had a van that, that somebody drove them around every day. We went to Chicago and bought Chinese food for them, Chinese cooking utensils. We got them a TV that had all these Kung Fu movies, you know, <laughs> that they could see and to make them happy. We gave them, you know, I mean, they never lived like that. And we had this Chinese guy working for us that, uh, I asked him one day, I said, how are the Chinese doing? He said, oh, they're not happy, right? They'd been there about three months. He said, they're not happy. I said, what do you mean they're not happy? What, what else they want us to do? He said, they want us to give them $500 a month each. What for? He said, because Americans have a lot of money and you can afford to do it. <laughs> I said, you gotta be kidding. He said, no. He said, they want to buy cameras and all this stuff to take back to China and they think we ought to give them $500 a month. He think we got a, a vault up there, we just go up and scoop money out <laughs> and give it to them. We got that kind of money. I said, you tell them, forget it. That's not in the contract. And of course that, you know, that died down, but it was a different deal. But I'll tell you, those, at that time, to show you how the economy was, well, I went over one time, was get on this airplane, and, and I always flew Japan Airlines, but this, they canceled the flight and had to go Chinese Airlines. So I'm out there with this, with this Chinese guy that's working for us, and I'm looking out, and I see these guys drive up on bicycles, ride up on bicycles. It looked like they're about 25 years old, and uniforms looked like they'd slip in, and they climbed up the stairs and got on that plane. And I said, who are those guys? And they said, that's the pilots. 
I said, that's the pilots that are going to fly that 747? He said, yeah. And he said, not only that, you know how much they make? I said, don't tell me. He said, they make $30 a month apiece. I said, you got to be kidding. We're going to get on that airplane <laughs> with those guys that we just saw. And he said, yeah. We did, and they got there all right. But, <laughs> but I tell you what, they have come alive. You, you, you see what's happened now. That was, that was in the early 80s, so it's, it didn't take them too many years to get going. <laughs>